All right, I'm finally here. Watched every single goddamn Nicolas Cage movie starting all the way back last year in December. Now here on August 13th, the 40th anniversary and debut of his career starting in a little small role in Fast Times at Richmond High. There were supposed to be 100 movies, but a movie called The Retirement Plan. The first time I checked back when I started this list, the movie was supposed to come out in 2021. Last time I checked it, it was two weeks ago and apparently it's not gonna be released until December of this year. 99. Really wanted it to be 100, but just 99. Also, there's gonna be a good chunk of these movies that I'm gonna forget about because I watched them like six months ago, five months ago, especially those VOD movies. I'm not gonna remember them. So, to close off my journey of going through Nicolas Cage's filmography, here is my ranking of all 99 movies as of 2022. Wife and daughter, you like? Oh, beautiful. Oops, they're dead. So the worst movie to me is Between Worlds. I did not like this movie at all. Nick Cage is playing like this truck driver. He befriends this lady, eventually moves in with her. And then along the way, the daughter like wants to be with them, like have sex with them and they do. And then there's like these side boys, side characters I don't care about. And then Nicolas Cage is somehow he is so calm whenever he's on fire, but then he's not in the other situations, which means that this movie was intentionally like just being satire or parody or the film filmmaker did not know what the hell he was doing the film also looks kind of ugly now here's the thing i don't want to shit on like this movie because it's hard it's not easy to make a film and gather all these people have a schedule and having a film out and just making it that's an achievement within itself so i don't want to completely shit on this movie because there's no effort put into it it's just maybe the effort should have been put into i don't know better script better looking movie hey god what you need photo shakes my friend I've always heard that these two Ghost Rider movies are not that great, specifically the second one. And so going into watching these, I was like, come on, these ain't going to be that bad. I think people are exaggerating. Come on. And I was wrong on the second one because Ghost Rider Spirit of Vengeance is not a good movie. At first, I thought the look of Ghost Rider was going to be good. And it was. But then he's really dark. Filter over his skull mask because the actual like look of it doesn't look that bad. It's just this black like paint finish on it. I don't know what it is, but doesn't look good. The villain looks like a goddamn vampire. I don't know why. Even in the first movie movie they look like vampires in dark clothing why idris elba is wasted in this movie he was pretty cool in this movie but again just kind of wasted just kind of there being like hey johnny blaze do something for me that's really it and then there's this little boy or a girl i feel like i'm forgetting that one big ass plot point with this lady and little kid i think that's this movie right i think because eva mendez is not in this one her and cage were a thing in the beginning and they just dropped that because that's not interesting at all at least there's cool shots of like the bike or car riding in flames that's that's a positive. Surprise. Yes, that's Stafford, Carl Stafford. Trespass is down this low because of the editing. And I still don't know if it's just YouTube's version or any other like Amazon is different because there's these weird, not bleeps, but silences throughout. Characters are gonna say like something bad, all right? And then it's just super silent. Audio's back up. For some reason throughout the movie, they switch the aspect ratio for certain scenes. I don't know why, but they do. And then both Nicolas Cage and Nicole Kidman aren't the best in this movie. I'm gonna assume that's bad directing because Cage is good and from what I've seen from Nicole Coleman she's good so they're not the best and then their daughter's the you know doesn't want to listen type daughter she goes out comes back gets in trouble there's a fake necklace there's an affair storyline in there why just why doesn't need that but it's mainly the editing that's what I'm gonna pay you to kill my wife didn't really like Grand Isle all that much Cage and his wife they're like scammers but in real life where they're willing to kill a person this guy needs a job but instead of going to like a fast food joint or a hotel or or I don't know, somewhere else. Cause you know what? Nicholas Cage with long ass hair and a gun. I'll do it. I'll take it. Fixing the car, fixing the fence. I feel like after he brought out his rifle and started shooting bottles on the fence, that should have been like, a, okay, I'm out. You clearly have issues with the wife, which is all just a ruse to be like, hey, come inside, go in the basement so we can kill you. And then the whole point of all this is that at the very end, you never know what your neighbors are like. That was the whole point of this movie, which I feel like they should have done something a lot more different than just a random guy. Maybe have an actual neighbor come by being like, hey and then realize oh shit my neighbors are a bit insane i forgot about outcast what the hell happens in this movie it is set in way back in the day medieval times or something like that nick cage is training young anakin or i guess not young anymore but anakin from the prequel star wars trilogy he is escorting this japanese chinese lady i think to somewhere they fall in love there's a kid he trains him but then nicholas cage is like i don't like you because you're a disappointment vice versa and then i guess the best part is cage dying dramatically by swords and people that was it and also that fight at 
itself there are way too many cuts in that fight just let cage and the actors or the stunt doubles do their thing stop cutting maybe the raw footage was really bad but still too many edits here and there and then that's all i remember because movies forgettable i would never recommend it because it's a waste of your time Time to Kill. I cannot find this movie anywhere on streaming or VOD, but I did find one on YouTube, which is not free on the free section of the YouTube movies. It is illegally uploaded as a video. So I don't know if people don't care about this movie, owns this movie now, but they either don't know about this or they don't care because I couldn't find it. Right now, it is still on YouTube. So if you want to watch this movie, watch it on YouTube, kind of illegally, but it's nothing much. Like he's in Africa, he falls in love with the lady, or I think he does does it's war a lot of the movie just him walking around and experiencing stuff it's like what's the point of all this and then oh yeah the whole point of this movie and the start of this whole journey is that he has a toothache and he needs to go to the doctor and check out his teeth so even the way that it starts it's like this is a really weird way to start a movie what felt like a long ass movie but it really wasn't Christmas Cure 2001. I don't care about this movie. I forgot about this movie. I think Cage voices a ghost and it's like British town during Christmas. I forgot about it and I don't care about it. Based off the posters for Firebirds, I thought this was going to be Top Gun, but with helicopters, and it is, but it's also, in a way, trying to be like Top Gun in a way, but not as fun, because it was so boring. It was rough getting through this movie. You have all the helicopter stuff, which are fine and boring, but then you also have this, like, love story. Why is there a love story in this when it's not as interesting, as boring as all of the helicopter sequences? I don't know why. Why is this here? And what's disappointing is Tommy Lee Wallace was in a movie with Nicolas Cage, and I thought it was going to be, you know, pretty good but they're both in this movie and it's kind of boring Dying of the Light, I believe Cage is playing a politician or just a really old ass person who's also a complete badass, knows how to use guns and run as well. It's also a kind of cool in a way because he's that old but still wants his revenge against his old nemesis who's come back, who is somehow alive and that's all he cares about, seeing Red, killing this person that he completely hates. But also ends in a very, not traditional but very predictable, he got his revenge but both him and his nemesis die, leaving his wife or family and friends all alone to commemorate him on his grave to end off the movie I don't really care about disaster movies, so Left Behind is one of them. Cage is a pilot, he meets his daughter beforehand, and that one dude from One Tree Hill, Chad Murray Ray? I always forget his name. I've not seen this actor and guy since, like, I think One Tree Hill. Recently, I think he's in a commercial with the rain and street lot parking lot thing, but seeing him was kind of like a, oh, hey, I remember you. Everyone in this movie is essentially getting Thanos snapped because they just disappear. Not in dust, but they just are gone. One second. It's like, what the hell? And then cars are coming through malls the daughter's on her own in the mall where everyone's disappearing while in the sky you have cage and chad dealing with pilot stuff and people freaking out people disappearing trying to figure out the whole situation and so yeah those two going on i guess one little like side minor plot is just the whole world disappearing which is is it explained i feel like it is but i don't care enough to research it again or definitely rewatch it so i'm gonna say yes and no or i don't know but i do like the movie doesn't end off in a very positive note because the whole world is essentially like gone to shit and there's nothing that they can do about it custody you cannot go so just quiet down my little one and call me dad trapped in paradise is a fine christmas family movie where cage has to deal with his two brothers who are out of prison and he is tired of them they make him angry make him go crazy ass cage they even rob a bank once where it's even accidental and way too easy that it's just like yeah okay i guess we're doing this now whatever i will say though watching a christmas related movie not in christmas or december is weird because i don't know i'm just expecting to hear like jingle bells and christmas ornaments and shit and so during like february I think was a bit weird this family gets the intention of the whole town police get involved they're kind of useless kind of play for laughs but then guess what what's important is that everyone is together during the Christmas weekend by the end they're a big happy family so it's a fun Christmas movie like it's fine but if you want to turn on your brain and just watch a mindless Christmas movie this one's for you and many men have simply given up 
USS Indianapolis. I forgot about this movie. I think it's about survivors. I think based on true events, like I think five days, there were like 300 survivors and soldiers were just stuck at sea with no help. So I don't want to seem rude and be like, I don't care about this movie, but that part of the story was good. I just wish the filmmaking and the way that it was told was a lot more interesting than very boring beginning. And then we get into the actual movie of soldiers being stuck at sea, being afraid, sharks coming by, not being able to eat or drink, surviving all of that. Someone needs to be blamed for this. And so Nicolas Cage is like, okay, I guess I'll be the one to be responsible for this, even though it wasn't really. There is a good story being displayed on here. It's just that the way that it's told, I just wish was a lot better. God damn it, I completely forgot. The runner. Cage is trying to be the mayor or politician of this city and fix it. However, he's faced with like backlash due to social media and I guess kind of the modern take on what it's like on being a mayor or trying to be someone, try to help town and city because he's getting called like these names and you know, whatever on the media and social media, but then also dealing with his own issues of like drug addiction, cheating on his wife with Sarah Paulson, who could have been any other actor because she does nothing. I mean, she doesn't do anything but still it's like eh, you know all right all of this would eventually lead him to his downfall until i guess he is like reformed or has a different perspective on how to be a leader how to run things and how to have actual change but this movie still feels like a straight to vod red box movie where there's a very generic script you have actors that are you know good but aren't used well at all Seeking Justice is just another, again, straight to VOD streaming Redbox movie. Nicolas Cage and, oh god, what's his name? Guy Pierce, who are not in cahoots, but at first their deal is like, hey, I will help you kill this guy for revenge, but in return, you will do me a favor. And obviously, right from the start, it's like, okay, this is a big red flag, but Cage is in grieving and he wants his revenge for someone hurting his wife, I think. And he does all these things, eventually finds out there's this group that want to help people but don't, and it's kind of laughable. I was like, wait a minute, what? This is kind of stupid and ridiculous. From the very beginning, Guy Pierce did not seem like a good guy. He just seemed like, yes, I'm not a bad guy, sure. And so there being this organization of people that want to help people, it's like, no, that sounds real stupid. Guy Pierce doesn't seem that good of a person if he's making Nicolas Cage do all these things that are illegal and bad. Jiu Jitsu. Nicolas Cage is in his own goddamn movie. Every time this movie cuts back to him, he is reading another script from another movie. Someone was like, okay, you know what? Grab him because he's Cage and now he's in his movie. There are certain points where I'm like, is this just a parody? Because there's even sci fi stuff. There's like these sci fi genetic robots looking thing. It's like, wait a minute, is this supposed to be serious? Not sure. I'm assuming serious because, you know, you have all these fights that are supposed to be taken seriously. However, there's really one good sequence in the very beginning. The president is trying to escape long wide shots of stunt people doing their job really well but aside from that every other action sequence it's fine but Nicolas Cage he's just in his own little world doing his thing and also you have to follow a main character who's just very bland very boring compared to Nicolas Cage and all the other characters that are way more interesting All I was thinking about while watching Knowing was the Black Ops 1 Mason like numbers line because Nicolas Cage is obsessed and realizes all of these like numbers and coordinates on the end of the world essentially. There's like this capsule that has been locked up for like 50 years and then 50 years later and now it's this key to saving the world or not even save it just like destroy it because it needs to happen and then apparently these two little kids a boy and a girl are the key to this Eden this happy life heaven life that are taken by essentially aliens they don't say this spaceship and these two aliens come in to take the kids but they're aliens probably and cage has to let them go go to his family because he knows the world's gonna end it is a very interesting way to have a disaster movie because aliens and sci-fi is involved and surprises and twists of numbers and aliens or actually you know what why are there aliens in this movie i don't even know if they needed to be there the story would have been fine if these two kids just went into this light or whatever and then the world ends and cage is there with his family but then they have to include aliens 
I like the concept of Humanity Bureau. The only issue and the big main issue is Nicolas Cage being fixated on saving this woman and her son because of reasons. I guess it's a reminder of his own family or something, but it's like you have this concept of the government will decide which human being is important or not or expendable. That in itself is cool, interesting, and kind of scary because at any moment the government's like, okay, you are not important because you make YouTube videos, get the hell out. It's like, wait, what? But we have to follow this like road trip family type thing. It's just, why? No, that's not the interesting part. It's the other stuff. Cage is able to protect this family until the very end. You find out that all these expendable humans are just being like killed off and put in this land where they're just bodies on top of bodies and bodies. And so that was cool. But why was that the main plot of the story instead of this protecting storyline? Cage should have been this lone ranger going throughout this whole future, getting rid of people expendables and finding out hey the government's line would have been way better than what we got if it likes you you can keep Cage be a wizard essentially was pretty funny. Same thing for Alfred Molina. Seeing him doing wizardy stuff was quite fun. But also the issue with that is their screen time is very limited. We have to follow this little boy, teenager, who's special because you have something that the other kids don't, which is I don't know, willpower or some shit. I have no idea. Anyways, we have to follow him. He falls in love with this one girl. There's a love scene or whatever. And also they love using that one Republic song, Secrets, I think. It's played like three, four times. You guys really love their music or the licensed, and then there's a a wizard villain who's very wizardy you know that's about it it's essentially harry potter but produced by disney ghost is a very boring generic ghost horror movie cage and his wife lost their kid because cage was not being responsible and he lost his child and now he wants to find their kid through supernatural means and supernatural ways and he starts getting jump scares and seeing shit going through dark hallways dark walls dark rooms it's a very by the book so supernatural story that i've seen a bunch of times and it's definitely one of those vod movies because who's even heard of this movie i haven't i was like wait this is a horror movie i haven't heard about let's see what it does and very generic does nothing really and would not be shocked if no one's even heard of it my end of the dope's worth more than the fifty thousand. take it bad lieutenant and that long ass name title what, what is it called port new orleans the only thing i know or care about about this movie is the addiction cage is addicted to like cocaine and coke and just drugs can't get over that and in a way it's kind of a coping mechanism for all of the disasters that happen which that part feels like a background thing it's more about addiction nicholas cage and what he's going through doesn't really feel like the actual incidents maybe that just me not caring but i didn't feel that like it was necessary or needed it was just kind of there and I also think it's funny that he had to see like another prisoner or this guy that he put behind bars be like, hey, in a way he's saying thank you. And he's like, I can't be like this. So, and that's when he quits being an addict and just stops taking drugs. Like it took him that much and that far to be like, oh, you know what? I'm not doing so well, but at least I'm not this guy. But overall though, it's just another, you know, generic action. I don't know. Can I even say this is an action flick? Because there is action, quote unquote, but it's not like whatever. It's fine. 211 or 211 essentially the life of a cop what it takes to be a cop there's a storyline between cage and his son-in-law awkward like hey we're family now but also we work with each other cage doesn't seem to be getting along with his daughter because he's talking to his son-in-law about his own daughter but then there's also this like kid that's getting bullied that part felt like a shoehorn like kind of forced thing where it wasn't necessary to have that kid in there this kid's getting bullied and like hey bullying's bad and it is bad but for this movie it felt like why is this here didn't really need to be here felt out of place this kid helps kind of along the way the son law gets shot once that happens you kind of know where the movie's gonna end where he doesn't make it cage is yelling at his co-workers being like where the hell were you guys this guy has a family now he's about to have a kid but now his daughter's gonna be a single mother now that part of the movie was good it's just everything else was like what are we doing here and like it's fine but now his own daughter she's gonna be a single parent i'm angela morgan katie wells Who's that? Inconceivable could have been better and could have been a bit scarier because you have this stranger coming into your life not being like, hey, I'm a nice person. But then, you know, eventually it's like, hmm, you aren't really that type of person, really. You seem like a very evil, villainous, manipulative person. And so that's what happens where Kate first is like, hmm, this woman is strange. Like, you know, she's nice, but why is she in our house? Gina, allow her into our house, which is a big red flag. Or why would you let a stranger? Yes, she's nice, but I would never ever be like, come on in. Like, no. Katie's 
somehow really wants to just be in this family's life like really really bad very psychotic very crazy she gets pregnant at one point and hold on i think it's his wife named angela she does and you don't know who like the father is or i think that's what happens maybe i'm just remembering wrong but either way angela gets pregnant cage and her are happy while katie is off in prison which was gonna happen but again leading up to that it was kind of like this eerie weird awkward moments a lot of it's like why the hell like just kick her out that's kind of the issue is like man get her out of here i don't care if she's nice if she looks good man get this lady out of here she's in your house she's invading your privacy this all feels really good to me right Looking Glass is about Cage and his wife wanting a new start to their life. They open up a motel, get people in, that's how they make their income. But issues arrive when you have really bad people, more specifically at night, doing really shady things like killing a person, bringing a knife, bringing a gun. And then Cage really loves his like glass, mirror, blank, invisible wall where he sees a bunch of crazy stuff, you know, a lot of weird stuff starts happening, which then puts both him and his wife in danger. And then they have to both leave and get out. They both are starting a new life at the very beginning. By the in they have to run away again and start a new one again and so that's kind of i don't know it's an issue but also kind of their whole thing because they have these fights and be like i want out and they're not doing so well but then eventually by the end of it they somehow come together again to go away together again and so they're probably gonna start up a new place have it run for like a couple of months or weeks or whatever and then leave again because they keep attracting these bad people it's like well then i don't know man just stop but that's also the point of it of this cycle of redoing this shit over and over again Zondali, Zandali, Zondali. Don't know how you pronounce that specifically, but this is a love affair movie and I don't care about it. It's just Nicolas Cage wants his girl and this girl's in a relationship with this other guy and he really wants her. And she does too because she's not being sexually satisfied. And so it's like, okay, I guess I'll just do something else. Along the way, she meets Nicolas Cage and he's like, I can satisfy you. And then that's where the issues begin and that's where the affair begins and it leads you to this boat chase, I think, and fights and arguments and I just don't care. Well, that's kind of the point here. I lost my family. G-Force. I thought it was pretty funny that Nicolas Cage is voicing a rat or just a little animal that's in the real world that are spies being trained by scientists to spy on bad people and infiltrate illegal things and I don't know. I thought it was fun. And then that's where it ends for me where it's just a really fun Disney movie, you know? The main animal or rat or hamster. Are they hamsters or rats? I forgot. You have the one that's in the suit or behind computers. You have the main guy. You have Nicolas Cage. It's just like whole, not whole but just kind of like adorable animals doing stuff. Deadfall is a very boring movie, but what isn't boring about it is Nicolas Cage. He is full on Cage and crazy in this movie. He is laughing hysterically to himself in a hotel room, and it's awesome. The way that he even dies is like, what the hell is going on? The main character, who is pretty much a bland, boring, heroic character, save people or whatever, kills Cage, putting his face in like a grill or something, or like a boiling water or whatever, and his face is ripped off. That's how he dies. That's the most memorable part about this movie. So don't waste your time watching this movie it's not that great just search up clips on youtube right now of this movie on cage laughing hysterically with his sunglasses and like i think little ass mustache it's like there's no way this is serious the Cotton Club is an homage to the 20s and 30s of jazz music in that era, which I don't care for. So a lot of this movie is like, okay, this is cool, but I also don't really care about it. It's also a musical, which I did not expect because a lot of it felt like a very, you know, mob story gangster movie. And while it still is, so very much a musical. So throughout these like moments of like very serious, like long coats scenes or whatever, the music comes on, it's like, I don't know, just saying jazz music. And it's like, okay, this is cool, fun, but i don't care and then it goes back to the whole like story of a murderer and getting money or whatever you know the movie works it's just i'm not really the audience for this movie it's good music but i don't care about 20s or 30s the homage to all that stuff and it is a bit jarring seeing like a scene go from this very serious scene and then cut to a musical number it's like okay 
Captain Corelli's Mandolin. This is a romance movie, a love story that I am kind of forgetting about. What's it about? Shit, hold on. Okay, so you have this lady whose name is Pelagia, P-E-L-A-G-I-A, Pelagia, whose husband is off doing some fishy things during the war, who's played by Christian Bale. Nicolas Cage just comes along being like, I'm the new guy. Well, okay, maybe not that, but he just seems way more exciting to be with than Christian Bale. Later on, turns out that he can't read or write, and that's very important to her because she's really into that well educated can read and write and want someone on her level and christian bale isn't that at all but nicholas cage is and he seems to be way more fun so she's going with them she leaves christian bale been wanting to you know see his notes and letters but then he doesn't write any or if she does receive them it doesn't seem like him just goes with nicholas cage they like fall in love and love affair it's fine the only thing worth seeing in Season of the Witch is Nicolas Cage and Ron Perlman because their banter with each other in this movie is a lot of fun. Their first scene together is making a bet on how many people they can kill. You know, it's kind of messed up, but it's also they're at war and this is, you know, way back in the day. So it's like, you know what? Let's try to have some fun. We may die, but hey, we made a bet. Yeah, a lot of that. Just them having fun. And there's one really good practical effect of like a couple in a bed pulling back and then seeing the rotting like skeleton faces. That was done really well. CGI green screen backgrounds of the fight but if they actually had all those like extras there good on them but the movie is bogged down by this witch lady like they have to save this girl and she has witch powers during like the black plague era of history and we have to meet the other soldiers seems like them walk in on horses and you know what thinking on it this movie is expensive because they had like all this armor and the horses and shit all these extras how much was the budget I feel like it's gotta be a lot right having all these extras and horses and shit like Game of Thrones but anyway Anyways, they all eventually die. This girl gets out and commemorates all the soldiers that sacrificed themselves for her because she's a witch. Like, she has powers and it's kind of weird. Like, I don't know how I feel about it. It's also like the weakest part of the movie as well because there should have been more Nicolas Cage and Ron Perlman. <laughs> Army of One has got to be a satire movie. It just has to be parody because Nicolas Cage is overacting this character who is a real life person that tried assassinating someone in real life that I forgot about, but it is based on true events. And the way he plays this character is so satirical, so over the top, it's ridiculous. But also over time, it gets annoying. It's also a satire. And so it's like, it's funny, but also annoying. I'm kind of torn on that. This person who's like, I'm gonna assassinate this person because I can, because I know you can't. There's like soldiers, not soldiers, bodyguards, you can't do that. In a way, Cage is kind of portraying the very ridiculousness of him. Just kind of making fun of that person who tried assassinating. That scene of him waking up was so fucking ridiculous and like, what is going on? There's points where it feels like a cartoon Looney Tunes type shit. It's like, what is going on? He rides like a llama or something, not even a horse. What is going on? It's hilarious. But it's also like over time, I think rewatching, I would get tired of his annoying voice, but it's also really funny. It sucks. But anyways, it's it's a fun movie just to kind of watch and laugh at and with Bangkok Dangerous is a American remake of the Thai version of the same name released back in 1999. Haven't seen that version yet, but this version, it's okay. I don't know why they have to put in this love thing between like Cage loves his Thai lady because he wants out of this life of killing people, but then he doesn't want to tell her that because she might see him as a monster, which he kind of is, and she does see him as a monster. He has a sidekick who is not the best and isn't developed at all really. Like he's just kind of the laughing person, you know, just laugh at him because he's funny or something. And and then the filmmaker doesn't know how to end it because there are two endings. One ending where it's kind of depressing and kind of tragic. Nicolas Cage loses his girl and kills himself because he doesn't want to live knowing that he's a monster and also an assassin. And then sets up like his sidekick to be like the next hero, which doesn't really work. And then the second ending, the alternate one is a very happy ending where the side guy saves Nicolas Cage and they're at an airport, says his goodbye, say that you'll be a great person, setting up, I guess, a sequel. But I think I prefer the more depressing end it fits the narrative more the movie's kind of a mess set up a sequel have a very lame script lame love thing and then just not a really well developed eye character as well
If Anchor has everything I want, that I would like, interesting premise of Cage being already dead, but being raised from hell to prevent the devil from being born, that sounds really cool. The issue is the execution. There's quite a bit of CG hand or just like 3D stuff flying at you, which isn't the best and looks laughably awful. It just kind of gets boring after a while. And then Amber Heard, who as of right now is, uh, you know, kind of an evil person, lost a trial and did some things here and there. But anyways, she's fine in this movie. She's the, I guess, bad ass chick in this movie that can hold her own gets punched by a bunch of people Nick Cage is having some fun and bars and whatnot there's stuff like that throughout the whole movie that's just not executed that well open it open it Jim. open it 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 the trust is about Nicolas Cage and Elijah Wood robbing some people or robbing something, a heist movie. Elijah Wood is obviously not down with this, but he's doing it because he needs money probably. And Cage is like, do it, fucking do it. Yelling at his face, going all out. And that's only one scene that I remember, which is why I'm kind of forgetting everything else. Like Cage is crazy. That's the good thing. Elijah Wood is the polar opposite, which is good, but feels kind of generic. And then everything else I kind of forgot about. I think they're like dirty cops as well knowing some inside things here and there but then over time it's like i'm not down with this cage is like shut up deal with it and then they have a shootout which isn't the best just fight each other but we'll have a shootout elijah wood actually beats cage but then gets killed because he's also on his heist and so everyone else is like kill on sight both of them die by the end i remember watching it being like so what was the point of this movie just bad cops story about how they can be corrupted or something i want money on this bank heist the only thing carrying this movie is cage and elijah wood and they're kind of polar opposites the true story of a legend who left history in his wake the Boy in Blue kind of feels like a Rocky type movie. It's overall kind of a sports movie, kind of. He has a trend really hard, being mentored by this older person, press someone, but also kind of in the same way where he wants to be with this girl. That's all he cares about. But then guess what? He has this sport he has to train really hard for. And this sport is like rowing your boat. I don't know what's it called. Rowing that long ass boat across the ocean or river or lake. Is that like an actual sport or just for this movie? Because I don't know what the hell that is. But then because of that whole like, I want to be with this girl, there seems to like the fit go on a date there's like a barn scene i don't know why there's a barn scene but there is but the feel of the movie is kind of like rocky training real hard there's a training montage is there no arrest me no all I remember from Running with the Devil is Lauren Fishburne's doing cocaine, having the time of his life while working with Nicolas Cage, who's the cook. There's like specific title cards for both of them. And he works at this restaurant as a facade in order to get all of these drugs and cocaine for money. And then while at the same time, you have this cop lady who's going after them. And all of it kind of didn't connect. I mean, it did by the end because she kills Nicolas Cage at the end. I guess the cocaine and drugs tied together, but she's off doing her own thing, being like a dominatrix, dominating this guy and it's like okay you know what's going on lauren fisher is doing the same thing doing cocaine having threesomes it's like okay and then you have scenes with him and cage together which is cool but what do they do waiting for a truck to get by or whatever okay and then cage is the one behind it pulling the strings selling shipping it overseas and whatever okay and then all of it ties together kind of by her coming over and then killing him because she's a part of the fbi kind of corrupted because she's lacking all these drugs and cocaine and then that's when the movie ends and again i don't know what else to say other than okay i've hit the mother loop ah. Primal is essentially Jaws with animals, wild exotic animals on a big ass boat. A bad guy or like a prisoner who's just awful, which begs the question, why is he even on this boat? Aside from he's bad and he needs to be transported, but why isn't he on like anywhere else aside from this place? Because he frees all these animals and they come and eat all these people. Now the look of these animals don't look the best. They're not awful. That jaguar coming in to attack Cage doesn't look the best, but doesn't look awful. There's way worse stuff that have a higher budget than this movie movie that look way worse more specifically t titans beast Boy tiger form i feel like that's way worse than what we have here and then all these people that we meet really quickly and then getting rid of them hella quickly as well that one kitchen scene with the three monkeys was like pretty brutal and then jean gray the older jean gray from the old trilogy movies she's in his movie because why not you know haven't seen her in a while can't help but think of tiger king when i watch this movie
the ant bully this whole movie is don't be a bully even if you're being bullied yourself don't let those bully inspire you to bully others this little boy is getting bullied he's like you know what i'm getting bullied life sucks i'm gonna start bullying these goddamn ants on this goddamn ant hill and they can speak it's fine it's a good kind of message to be like don't be a bully don't be an asshole you know that's really it this kid learns not to be a bully no more he gains some friends that one big guy bully goes away doesn't bother him no more i think the ants are giving jelly beans because the kid helped them in a way this is ant hill thing that goes into this underground ant group thing the movie's fine don't be a bully that's it Joel. So in the same way that Ant Bully was about bullying, don't bully your kids or abuse them because Nicolas Cage will come after you. He'll come for your ass, okay? This kid who is Cyclops from the new generation of X-Men movies, he's getting abused and bullied by his own father. Cage is like, you know what? I'm gonna kill him, which is a very extreme reaction to that. You know, it's like, goddamn, okay. Over time, both Joel and Cage, they have a father-son relationship and he is willing to protect this kid because why not? Or more most likely i forgot about the reason as to why he wants to help this kid that's also another possibility and so in the end cage actually kills him and he dies himself and cyclops in order to commemorate him decides to rebuild or regrow this tree that these men cut down because of their job or something they work in like the lumberjack woods area that's where most of the movie takes place in the woods big lands in the background and he'll get it so if you don't want to tell us the truth now we can't help you then you can threaten me you think you can threaten me Bob. The Frozen Ground. I believe this is also another based on true events story, which I think it is happening in Alaska. And I just kind of wish that the movie itself was better because the ending is kind of an homage to all these victims that were taken by John Cossack's character. And it was like, okay, this is like a nice kind of way to end the movie off, showing the actual real life pictures of these victims and also all the unknown victims as well. Just kind of wish the movie was a bit better. John Cossack is creepy in this movie. There's just scenes and shots of him just looking out kind of in his own head. Head. what is he thinking cage is that heroic cop trying to save people he's fine and then cindy is the survivor i think the only survivor who escapes and is willing to not tell her story at first because she's so scared of him and so she goes back to her old ways of stripping and being alone self-isolating which is not good and kind of the whole point as to why she got captured is because she was all alone and john kosak saw that as like my opportunity i'll take someone who's very much all alone down on life taking advantage of that so much of the cop stuff with cage feels like it's padding out the runtime and then there's a truth where he's like i should have killed you when i had the chance tells all the cops and like where he buried all the bodies but then there's more unknown victims less cop stuff more john kosak stuff he actually could have been a really creepy person and he still is i guess i wanted more of that Teen Titans go to the movies. It's fine. It's more of a kid's movies because there's fart jokes immediately and then just continues. I like the story of Robin being like, all right, I'm gonna have my own movie and my own team and he doesn't get it. There's a Batman movie. There's an Alfred movie. There's a Batman belt movie. That whole like theater bit was pretty funny. But aside from that, it's not a movie for me. I don't mind the Teen Titans. I do like them, but they're not like my favorite group ever. And then Cage as Superman, which feels like it was intentional to be like, let's have Nicolas Cage voice superman because he was supposed to play superman in like the mid 2000s or something there's like videos out there but i guess this is in a way cage finally getting to play the role of superman i have no life my brother johnny took my life from me moonstruck is the third affair movie i think this is a third one i guess cage likes being in affair movies but he has a brother who's getting married and he decides to make a move on her and she doesn't mind that play by Cher. The singer Cher, I think that's how you say her name. Over time, they're like, hey, we're gonna be in-laws now. Cage makes a move. Things get a lot more complicated. Kind of awkward. I don't know. It's another love affair story that isn't bad. Just I don't care for. I don't remember how it ends. How does it end? I think she gets with Cage because she doesn't like her current husband. Boring or just not there for her. Yeah, I don't know. But I do remember the movie having these like heartfelt moments between both of them. even about i think this character in ip is originally from japan i think i think there's mangas about it that's a big i think but either way cage is forcing this father who's a scientist who wants a son i was like you know what i can't have it because of no one being around so i'm gonna make my boy he makes astro boy who is just the most powerful robot ever can save the world and like with any sci-fi robot movie i guess not all of them but some of them these robots has emotions they can control it what's the point if i'm just a machine and all that typical sci-fi 
sci-fi stuff that I don't really mind. There is a part of me that was like, hmm, what if he turns bad, like evil Superman? But I don't know, based off the posters and him being very happy and smiling, he is too good. He is too positive. And then also the animation isn't visually pleasing to me. Like kind of this 3D type animation isn't all that great to me. It's not going to ruin the movie for me, but just visually it's like, this is not pleasing to look at as long as the story is good and the movie keeps me from being like, this is not look good at all, then it's okay. rom-coms are my thing but seeing Nicolas Cage and Sarah Jessica Parker in a movie about them having like a wedding and then Cage losing all his money having to fight back for her because she goes during other honeymoon on this trip with this older guy who is much more calm and doesn't waste his money and so this whole movie is Cage trying to get back his girl but also not really because Sarah Jessica isn't in love with the other dude she just wants time away from Cage because he made a horrible mistake and then somehow the movie takes place in Vegas and then goes all the way in a Hawaii back to Vegas just for a bit which I didn't understand why I mean I get it why for the story but why Hawaii just stay in Vegas with all the casinos and smoking and whatnot why go like a few days in Hawaii and then come back over here and then you know he eventually gets her back because it needs to be happy it's a rom-com I don't think I've ever seen a rom-com end on a downer note because it would be pretty depressing if Keish did all of this and be like I didn't get her back that would I, you know what kind of get it now that'd be pretty depressing honestly but either way it's a fun-ish okay rom-com the first Ghost Rider movie isn't as bad as the second one doesn't mean that it's good because the CGI is somehow better than the second one like it's fine it's dated the skull doesn't look real at all it looks like it's got a matte finish to it Cage as Ghost Rider I do like it but it could have been someone else all he wants is Eva Mendes who was his teenager love life I think they eventually meet again and then later on in the second movie they just drop her but that's a thing that's like a large part of the movie and then his father died as well and so he He's all down and whatnot. And then guess what? Vampires. They're not really vampires again, but still, why do they look like goddamn vampires? I don't get it. This is before the Twilight Saga stuff, I think. A year before? 2007 or 2009, this movie came out. Right before or right after the Twilight stuff. White makeup and dark clothing. Even though they're like demons, I think. Someone behind the scenes must have really loved vampires to be like, they're not really vampires, but we'll make them look like vampires because why not? A lot of people seem to really love or hate Willy's Wonderland. I'm in the middle where I think it's okay. A huge mistake I think is not having Cage speak. Now I get it, him not speaking in the whole movie is kind of this badass like cool guy. I don't know, Lone Ranger type person that's all lonely, all alone and loves playing that pinball machine which is the best part about the movie, all those scenes and all the killings of those like robots or puppets or machines that look like Friday Nights or Freddy's. But the best part about Cage is him speaking, him going full Cage crazy. When I first watched it, it kind of gave off this impression that took those rules just because he would not speak in the entire movie and so i thought it was kind of lazy on his part but no it's probably just like the script of hey you're gonna be this cool guy with sunglasses playing pinball machines but don't speak i kind of get to an extent why they did that but still would have preferred if cage actually spoke and then all the kids teenagers they're useless they're badly written don't care about them they're kind of insufferable except for one that one girl she's with cage at the ending with like this soda drinking both of them drive off leaving this place which by the way is all kind of this inside job of this guy who owns it going there and work all alone for like a sacrifice of this puppet people or whatever the gore is good it's a mix of i like some of the cage not speaking is an issue the kids are not that great the story behind it is sure fine and then those scenes of the pinball machines and him just going crazy were fun so i'm just in the middle on this one Prisoners of the Ghost Line. I think the one thing I love the most is the mashing of the genres and types of things that are around. Like this samurai town has Japanese inspired stuff in it, kimonos and the walls and whatnot. But then you also got like Western stuff in there, modern signs. It's like whoever made this loves Westerns, Japan culture and the look of it with kimonos and then like modern signs. But that first like sequence of him just coming out naked, looking around, being like, this movie is visually interesting. Let's see where it goes. Where it goes is 
fine. Cage gets his balls exploded for assault. He has to save this girl because he needs to redeem himself from killing this little boy from the very beginning, which was very much predictable as to he didn't do it. It was this other guy that wanted to rob this bank. This little boy just like, hey, you want this candy or toy? Boom, gets shot. This little boy was acting so pure and innocent and that just ended up getting him killed. There's just scenes of them like just him walking on land out and it looks nice. So while it's visually pleasing and kind of interesting to look at and watch, the story itself is fine. Very much predictable in terms of him making it there, defeating this person and then finally being let go, being let free. The entrepreneur, the blue collar American dream, you know. I make money, I build jobs in my community, blah, blah, blah. How's he doing? The best parts about Arsenal is the brother stuff where you have this older brother trying to shield away his younger brother from seeing all this messed up stuff. Like the father dying in the house, committed suicide, tells his younger brother, hey, go away. That would obviously, you know, have an effect on him into adulthood because he has a kid, his wife is gone, kicked out of the military, and then he goes to work for Nicolas Cage, who by the way, looks goofy as hell. He has like this bowl cut-ish type broccoli Mike guy haircut with sunglasses and a mustache. He looks like he's from deadfall again over the top ridiculous which i would have want more of but we don't sadly the younger brother has to step up and do all these dirty deeds that his older brother didn't want him to do having a gun killing people but also he's more successful because he has a family he's got this nice house nice place yard the fence the dogs everything gotta see my brother because he's probably like this because of me not wanting me to see all these like horrible things you don't want them to see some crazy gnarly shit he eventually with the help of john Colsack, which i almost forgot about that he was in this movie for some reason and they get his brother back get rid of cage and the higher ups who cage was working for which i forgot about who it was but that doesn't matter movie ends off with the two brothers once again playing some baseball like they did when they were younger I feel like I should have liked Mandy a lot more, but I just don't. 50 minutes of Cage spending time with his wife and then eventually getting kidnapped, taken away from her by this cult. I feel like that took way too long and then maybe this is just on me wanting more, but there was not a lot more. There should have been a lot more crazy stuff in the movie. I mean, there already is. Cage in that bathroom scene, going crazy. That chainsaw like battle was kind of ridiculous, but fun. There's definitely gore in the movie and the way that the movie ends with Cage looking all bloodied up and big white eyes. It's like, that's gonna get me nightmares but i don't know i just don't seem to like it as much as some others do i just think the narrative wasn't there for me it was kind of okay but everything else was good going in to watch world trade center i was kind of worried because is it offensive or kind of like good to make a movie about 9 11 five years after the event but watching the movie now it's not really offensive it's more so showing you the different perspectives from everyone from people on the plane from people working and then trying to get people out from the people at home people at the airport which all of it is terrifying i think the firefighters are real life people so cage michael pena all these characters they're playing real life characters that that somehow lived through all the rebels in this tower so the movie i think it's more informative and it kind of if you were alive at this time i was but only like a year old so for people that live through this moment there have been plenty of obstacles along the way but it's nothing us crews can't handle the crew to new age is more of the crew but now we have the girl's boyfriend that's along and then they found out there's this tropical area this land full of bananas and well i guess more bananas all over which comes into play because his parents are like feeding this beast that needs bananas and if he doesn't get it he's gonna wreck this whole entire place which is what happens because they don't have enough bananas the father ate all the goddamn bananas and now they have to pay the price for it the other son is like watching tv quote unquote with a cardboard box trying to escape from his actual life you still the old ass grandma being crazy the baby still being very much energetic and crazy as well the father's still very skeptical very like get away i don't trust you everyone except me and my family are bad people but just more of the crudes which is fine what you want to hear my pitch go away god damn it adaptation there's a certain point where i just did not care about this movie it's a party scene where cage is pulling double duty he's playing twin characters of the same face one of them's a very shy introverted character one of them's very outgoing wants to write a script wants to be something else and that scene alone was like okay i don't care about this i feel like i know where this is gonna go but the best parts are the interactions between cage and cage setting things up he's able to talk to himself very well and then all of the drug stuff with meryl street coming back later on in a car crash with like 
two of the cages i was like okay like she's a writer as well and she's addicted to cocaine or whatever and somehow that relates all the way back to the twins and it's like okay now i really don't care because it wasn't needed at all i feel like the whole movie should have been just cage and cage talking to each other about screenplay and being roommates being twins going outside so the technical aspects of this movie of shooting cage in two roles that's the best part really like that the story isn't there for me Snowden. So this movie I actually knew quite a bit about because it was all over the news and all over social media at the time of this guy named Snowden who worked for the government or yeah I think government leaked out information about the government spying on all of us with the cameras and whatnot and more things I forgot about and so halfway I was like wait a minute I feel like I know this and I do because it was everywhere. The movie is not like really good or bad it's okay it's more again very informative as to Snowden's life where he went to school his love life and why he did what he did getting all of these people involved and me like hey just know that your life is going to be different if this doesn't work out and if it does you gotta go somewhere else and then getting to actually see the actual snowden at the end of the movie giving like this speech very last minute thing was nice being like, okay that's his actual face it's the real deal masquerading as an act hiding behind a few 50 dollar tricks next really cool premise of cage having these powers see the future but then rewind time and 30 10 seconds it's a very small window of time however it is bogged down by his love for jessica beale who is not the best character she's just there for nicholas cage to be like hey i met you at this diner and he keeps retrying to retrying to get to this girl and he really does and doesn't tell her his secret has to eventually this is all useless it does not need to be there just get rid of it but then you also have julianne moore's character who who wants Cage because of his powers. He can save lives and people. Cage wanted a normal life, telling everyone just to back away. I don't care about anyone else but me and Jessica Biel, Julianne Moore going after him, and then bad people as well, which barely develop. It's more so, hey Cage, go save this person or this building. We don't want it to explode. Do it. Or else we'll like imprison you, which thinking back on it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. He listens to now run away from Jessica Biel, gets in a car with Julianne Moore, and he's going off to be a hero, quote unquote. Even though he doesn't want to be, he has these powers and has the motivate responsibility to step up. Hey Rusty James, we just about gave up on you. My child, take you on for one hey, Rusty James. Can he live up to his brother's name? Which is the whole point of this movie. Cage is actually good in this movie. This is one of his first few roles aside from Fast Times and he's like pretty damn good. He's you know wearing like the biker jacket with Rusty and his friends and you know with them being in a city they have to have a gang. A rival gang. Kind of this mob slash gangster type rivalry and they're in underground. They have a fight. There are some of these fights brother are kind of ridiculous which again I think it's on purpose but it's also like these are just teenagers young adult and they're able to do these ridiculous ass punches and whatnot i think a person goes flying at one point rusty james though his whole thing is identity he wants to live up to his brother's name but also doesn't want to be him doesn't know where he wants to go rides a goddamn motorcycle and it's like okay what do i do now don't want to be my brother don't want to be someone else who am i essentially and throughout that journey he's still trying to find it at the end A valley girl plays on traditions girl named julie she's like from the valley but then cage is not from the valley he's from the city and it plays with like why would you date someone from another city or state when they have just different cultures and different areas that they hang around and just all the stereotypes of family members being like hey don't get with this guy he might be creepy or weird or vice versa don't get with that girl because she's too nice she's not a bad girl and all these things that you would have to hear i will say though that city from cage looks kind of you know like urban kind of rural area looks kind of shady you know the bar lots of people a lot of drugs be taken and so in a way actually why some of her friends and family are like you know what don't don't do that okay that side of town is really weird and messed up but you know what that doesn't matter because both cage and julie are in love and it's like you know what who cares what the hell they think as long as we're happy that's all that matters you bomb no you don't want to be with me it Can Happen To You is a very predictable but also kind of a wholesome movie where Cage is with his girlfriend and she's kind of an asshole, you know, kind of mean, wants nice things, loves money, very shallow. And he meets this waitress who is trying to make it work hard for money and just getting by by paychecks. Cage is a cop who's just trying to be nice. He's a good ass cop helping people all around this city and is very likable. Over time, it would just kind of make sense that these two people that are nice kind of think the same way and both just trying to be nice people 
people they would you know be a thing i think cage even saw like the flyer or something to like donate money i think it's the whole entire town realizing that these two people are really nice people and so they just donate money to help them clean up this whole entire store so they can live in it and they eventually find a place and then afterwards they want to give back to the community that helped them so they just like throw i think money just to give back so it's a very sweet wholesome just really nice movie about nice people or just people in general that working hard trying to get by meeting other nice people you know they're really nice wholesome movie very sweet movie meanwhile you have his ex who i think got a divorce and got a bad husband or something she made a wrong choice of leaving nicholas cage It's a love story. I think this is the one about this mother getting assaulted. These people and criminals, they got away with it. And so Nicolas Cage is like, you know what? Time to go full on Cage and, you know, just take this issue and make it my main goal of getting rid of all these people. And he does in very funny ways. There's this waterfall scene of Cage shooting this man. He goes flying. It doesn't make any sense as to why he goes flying. I'm assuming the bullets so goddamn powerful. It's like he's gonna go flying, but it seems ridiculous. Makes this dude go flying out, kills his other dude. By the end, he doesn't get in trouble for i mean he does but they're not gonna you know fire him which i thought was kind of weird but either way well, you have this daughter who is kind of scared because the mother might kill herself and there are times where the mother's like you know what i'm gonna commit suicide because what's the point of living they lost their trial these bad people got away life sucks seeing that like perspective of what happens when a person is assaulted his beef is with me beef beef a score to settle best part about the movie is cage and his son there's this one scene of them driving in his nice ass car just having a fun time a very wholesome fun time but then you also know that cage cannot let go of his vengeance and so over time he's like hey son let's be together you know he's been away for a long ass time but then in his mind he's like i want to kill all those people that turned me over and so he gets his vengeance ready he goes to a person to person one by one killing all of them he finds out his son got him in prison where his son knew about his dirty deeds and very bad people shut his son up this group decided to send him to prison without knowing that his own son was the reason as to why he went to prison but that doesn't matter because in his final moments he sees his son his son died earlier and so he's like, you know what i'm going out seeing my son going to the afterlife nice way to end off the movie because that was the best part him and his son just bonding now you can argue that his own son was the reason as to why he was in a prison it's a very stupid kind of twist but i don't know i didn't really mind it i think i might overlook that because of the relationship between him and his son to have you available to us, Mr. Fowler, at our convenience. All right. Oh no, Doug. Guardian Tess. Again, the best part about the movie is Cage's relationship with this old ass lady who is a very important lady. I think she's like the first lady of the UK or something. I don't know actually. I forgot. Either way, she's a very important person and he has a protector and watch over her. It says, I don't like you old lady and vice versa back to him. It's like, you're so annoying and I don't like you. I hate you. But over time, both of them know that, you know what? We don't really hate each other. We don't mind each other at all. You know, you're not too bad even though you are an old ass important lady and and Cage is a Nicolas Cage. It's like, you know what? You ain't so bad. And it just takes a kidnapping to be like, you know what? I actually do care about this test lady. Let's go save her. And so he goes kind of crazy. There's just one scene of him trying to get information out of this guy. Pulls his gun out. Wants to explode his goddamn head. And his partner's like, don't do it, man. This guy just, he's useless. And he's still like, shut up. Give me all the goddamn information. Eventually, he's able to save her. But then guess what? They're back to their old banter of like, shut up. And that's just kind of their banter, which is really fun. Stolen. Once again, the driving force for Cage is trying to protect someone that he loves. In this case, it's his own daughter. He was in prison for stealing some stuff and gets caught for it. Which, by the way, that driving sequence was actually done really well. Small level parking lot area. He wants to rekindle with his daughter, you know, just be like, hey, I've missed you. Try to have some time together. But that one guy that he shot in the leg, that one person is like, you know what? I'm not over this. I want my money. So go get my money. And so he's just going to cops for it. They don't believe him. Got out and trying to do this. You have your daughter and so he's like you know what i guess i gotta do this by myself and he does the cops and fbi being like go after cage but then they soon realize hey you know what this guy that supposedly died he's still alive trying to frame this guy it's a very simple movie it's not a very complicated movie at all but what makes it work for me is that it's very simple you know it's a very straightforward like revenge slash action ish type flick that just has this really like simple goal of i want to get my daughter back i hate to even come here and ask can i get that drink now please 
and I had to ask a few of the others too. Gone in 60 seconds was essentially the fast saga before the fast saga. It's all about cars. Cage owns like a mini car area for kids. He got out of the car business because it was illegal. Now he's drawn back in because his brother's in trouble with money and the big leagues and he even has a team aka a family. Like either fast copy this or vice versa. Either way it is very specific to like the fast saga nowadays. Angelina Jolie's in this movie and this is right before the two murder movie there's that one dude who's like that killer from that train movie i forgot his name but he's in here but the goal is still 50 cars and under a certain amount of time but then i get caught by the cops and then there's even car scenes and chase sequences this whole movie been like the first movie in that franchise and then vin diesel and the others just take over and be like we are now the saga essentially it is a fun movie because the banter between cage and jolie are good the others as well are good but not as good as them and then the cop coming in being like okay we're adding sticks but also you ain't so bad so go away or else i'm gonna regret it and then cage having to come back in being like i'm too old for this shit i guess i'll do it one more time one last time able to save his brother get some money here and there but then also have family group gathering as well benjamin gates has spent a lifetime hunting treasures that have been lost to history take a look at this National Treasure Book of Secrets. This one isn't as good as the first one because it doesn't have any heist montage or really cool music of like setting up plan and infiltrating the plan and whatever. But it's still a fun movie. It's a good sequel that is more of kind of the same. They have to search like this rural area to find treasure. The one that's never worked for me is Cage and oh god, what's her name? Abigail. That has never really worked for me because I don't care about that at all. Really, they try in the first film. Sure, it's whatever. This one, it's like they're having issues and then there's that one great scene of cage being over the top yelling dramatically and loudly being like okay you want to have problems let's yell that out there's also more uncle ben he gets like a plot in this movie gets his own girl it's like okay i don't think that was needed he just needs to be the supportive father of cage that's really it but sure why not have more of him and then riley ain't doing so hot you know he's just he's not selling books car got towed away and getting no girls and life is rough for him the villain who cares even in the first one they don't really matter no one cares about that we do care about is the treasure the hunting with nicholas cage and his friends this week for a month i don't know you knew anybody in intelligence hey <laughs> <laughs> well, next year bear out me I didn't know where to place Wind Talkers because one, I forgot I watched it. Two, it's a war movie, which I don't really care for. But you know what? It's a pretty damn good war movie and pretty brutal as well. Watching your friends die or comrades die right in front of you, that's some brutal stuff. You have scenes of them playing cards and bonding over, you know, smoking or whatever. And like, you know that some of these dudes, if not all of them, they're gonna die brutally. Seeing their limbs fly off, it's not a fun sight. So I do love that part of the movie where, hey, we're being buddy buddies, you know, we're having a good time. Hopefully we don't die right. Aside from that though, there's this guy who speaks Japanese they have someone on their team that they can like get into the whole Japanese gold breakers which is why they want to protect this one dude that can't really fight the thing that got me interested was the whole like hey don't die they all die and then trying to protect this one dude that can like stop this Japanese code breaker stuff but those scenes of like cage and everyone reacting to their comrades dying it's definitely one image and scenes that'll probably stick with you <laughs> mom and dad is a scary movie because it leaves a thought in your head like what if my parents were just like you know what i'm tired of your shit i'm gonna kill you what if that happens one day to all of us all of a sudden our parents are like i don't want you anymore like hell no uh-uh i don't want to kill my parents but yo don't come after me that's essentially this whole movie mass hysteria and then one by one everyone and their parents are like oh my kids i want to kill them main cast like kids they're not that great they're fine dumb but that's a script like there's this one house scene where a girl and her friend they go to their parents house this friend is like hey mom what are you doing it's like yo get away get out of that goddamn room and she doesn't which you know what it is her house like her parents house so she has no reason to be like i'm scared of my parents because this is my house you see your mom laying on your bed with like a knife or something looking at you all weird goodbye i'm out even at the end where cage is tied up with his wife and then they're like no we love you guys but sometimes you guys just drive us crazy and so that's kind of in a way what's happening to these parents parents love their kids so much but also sometimes they want to you know kill them or strangle them because they go crazy and sometimes they might be crazy enough to hurt their kids stupid ass white boy in two thousand dollar suit gets cap trying to be a hero news at 11 that's what you want to see you want to see cash up in here you want me to set it son 
I think The Family Man is about Cage choosing like his high career work because there's two movies that are called The Something and The Man from Cage and so I believe The Family Man is about like him on Christmas Eve or Christmas Day stopping this robbery who is played by Don Cheeto who looks ridiculous like nowadays I see him as a general or war machine in the MCU but seeing him with a hoodie and a cap and just it seems very stereotypical after waking up he gets a second chance he gets to have a family a wife his kids he's not really rich no more he lives in a house not this apartment complex full of nice things and he doesn't like it because he's afraid of commitment and the freedom of going anywhere he wants no actual responsibilities aside from his own and then not have to worry about his wife his family his kids in-laws and he doesn't like any of that but over time he's like you know what this ain't so bad he had a chance to be like career or this lady he chose his own career that is all he cared about his own self kind of selfish in a way but if a person doesn't want to be like a family man then just let them be you know but doubts so once it reverts back to the normal like timeline which is being done by Don Cheeto by him kind of ridiculous he's back to his high complex apartment is okay you know what that was my second chance why not take that advantage and actually pursue it he has everything he has but he's not happy because he's very much lonely doesn't really have anyone and has all the money in the world but money doesn't equal happiness The Wicker Man remake, I know, is not a good movie, but I don't care because I had a really fun time watching it. The only reason I knew about this movie is because of memes. All the memes, my eyes, the bees, what it burn, what it burn, and just him punching all these people on his fucking island. I thought after finding out what's going on, which by the way, he should have known stuff was going on when he saw that blood and that human blood in that bag and didn't search any further. I would have been like, what is going on here? I'm getting out of here. But no, he's like, I gotta stay. But I thought after that, the tone of the movie gonna be you know very serious and while i think it is him pushing all these people and all these ladies on this island were just hysterical i thought it was pretty damn funny the actual story i don't really care about i think his family got in a car crash he keeps seeing that i think that doesn't matter i've yet to see the original like 70s movie version because i kind of don't care about it i know this movie's not that great but everyone can agree that it's a very memeable movie and that alone makes it somewhat great I had no idea what Dog Eat Dog was. It sounded like a comedy parody film, but it's really about three people being played by Willem Dafoe, Christopher Matthews, and Nicolas Cage, who are just horrible people. They've been in prison, Cage owns a club, but the overall like theme of it is that these are not good people at all. They are bad people. And you know, they try to be good, but they just can't, especially Willem Dafoe. He like kills his wife and I think kills his daughter. Maybe I just didn't wanna see that scene because it's pretty messed up. But you know, he starts killing again. Christopher matthews he's trying to go on a date with this lady things are working out they're at the hotel but then he starts yelling and it's like too much too much aggressive that lady's scared she backs off and they at least try but in the end they can't because of insecurities and these like thrills that they get of getting off of just doing dumb bad things eventually willem dafoe is killed by christopher because he's so bad and realizes that he has to be put down meanwhile nicholas cage is doing his own thing getting caught by the police eventually all of them get killed dafoe gets killed christopher and then last cage he's like in this red fox smoke area he's like you know what i'm gonna sell this old couple's car doesn't kill them but in his final moments he's like you know what i'm a horrible person might as well go out in the most badass way of getting shot and he gets killed it's a very not downer i guess it's downer but i don't know it's a very interesting film about watching three people three bad people doing bad things trying to be good for a while but there's like you know what let's just go back to our old and bad habits Racing with the Moon is about two friends who want to, you know, do all these things before they go off to war because they have to be. I think it's mandatory during this time to be like, hey, if you are of this age and a male, go to war. If you don't, you suck. Or something like that, right? And so before this time, Nicholas Cage and his friend, they want to do things that are fun, right? They don't want to, you know, spend their last days being like, oh no, war is a scare. At first, they're like, you know what? Why not? Let's go to war. But then in this town, his friend is like, oh shit, people are hurt, losing limbs. This is kind of scary, yo. I don't want to do this and so it's kind of the realization of oh shit i don't really want to do this but i have to but then also his friend wants to be with this girl and he does but then what if he doesn't come back and he dies and there's a lot of complex things going on because he can die him and Kate, they don't want to go to war he wants his girl but then what if he doesn't come back and his parents are like iffy on it as well of like we don't want you to go but it's kind of like mandatory because kid soldiers so good luck and in a way this is testing their friendship do we still want to be friends if i want to go with this girl do you want to go to war i don't want to go to war and 
time. They both work at this bowling alley, but there is this train track they always like running on. It comes back at the end where they only have each other. Or there are other kids, but they don't want to be with them. So the movie ends with them being like, you know what? Goodbye to everyone. We have to go off to war and running on the train tracks like in the beginning of the film and as they did throughout the whole movie. What was supposed to be a very simple job for Nicolas Cage turned into something much more bigger and worse than he thought in Red Rock West. He's just looking for a normal job to get some money, but then he's mistaken for someone else, a hitman. Starts going to these weird ass places, shady ass places, meets this lady who's gonna get killed by this hitman because of her husband or a friend? Money as well. So he's like, you know what? I want out. Gets away from this other hitman and this guy at this bar. This leads into this domino effect of getting this girl, being with this girl, trying to skip this girl, getting by the hitman this guy at this bar eventually the cops get by but then also he learns that you know what i can't trust any of y'all trace cage but he knew that so the gun is empty throws out most of the money but then keeps a little bit just for himself so that he can get by I think this all took place in a day or two like it was a very small amount of time for this movie to take place and so he had a crazy ass like one two day trip of if you want to count his like road trip that's like three days so maybe a week his crazy ass week of like finding this job getting into the wrong business getting caught for it and then somehow getting out of it alive Rage's movie, I thought, based off the title, was Nicolas Cage going berserk, just killing anyone because someone killed his daughter, he's going full on rage, right? Or cage. But it doesn't go that way because he has this past of Russians and really shady ass people, and he thinks Russians are after this killing. I expected the movie to go kind of like John Wick, killing someone you love most to you, killing that one person in their group that are responsible for this. However, the funny part about that is that this Russian guy and Cage, they never actually meet in the movie. And the person that killed his daughter was just a friend that accidentally shot his gun and so i really like that because well maybe you know those scenes of that russian guy killing this dude with brass knuckles and his fists are useless sure it also shows that he just going on this road of rage that is unnecessary and then he could have killed this kid as well that killed his daughter but he's like you know what just go away instead of letting this rage like eat him up like, you know what? i'm gonna stop this be at peace and just kind of let himself get killed that's what's best for him and his wife now who's just pretty much all alone if he continues on this rage cycle and just killing cycle it's gonna repeat to his wife and his other loved ones Peggy Sue got married. It's a fun movie. It's about Peggy Sue who somehow has the ability or something happens where she's back in time, back in high school. And it's, you know what? This is my second chance to redo high school, which I'm kind of in two camps where you have the second chance of being like, okay, I can hang out with all these kids or the cool kids or do like a ceramics major or art major, right? But then also you're an adult now and you're still thinking about high school and think that, you know, high school or your glory days, that's pretty sad because you haven't moved on from that. But this is our chance to get with Nicolas Cage and maybe hang out with the cool kids or be part of the cheerleading team or whatever right it's seemingly everything's going the same nothing's really changed peggy sue to reflect on the pains and joys of adolescence she's not doing so well right now however it is kind of a dream kind of where she wakes back up in present time and she's next to charlie aka nicholas cage and they you know reconnect talk about whatever to end off the movie and in a way kind of refixing things maybe in her head it's like yeah you know maybe i did travel back in time and reflect on my past mistakes and regrets but it's also like you know what early can just be like like this old friend or old girl that I used to like. Let's see what she's doing or whatever. Or if she's okay. The weatherman. Cage is playing this weatherman who talks about the weather on the news. But he's not happy. He's tired of people coming up to him. Like, hey, are you the weatherman? Can I take a picture? He doesn't care anything about that. And he's just miserable. He hates life, essentially. So he's like, you know what? I'm going to attempt to get my life together. Try to reconnect with his daughter, his wife. Daughter stuff works out, kind of. Kind of makes her into a semi, like, serial killer. Because she hates being bullied. She wants to get an arrow and shoot an arrow into, like, this girl's heart, essentially. But then that doesn't work out because there's a great scene of them at this like arrow like place doesn't work out they just walk out immediately but then later on he's like, you know what this is how you shoot an arrow the wife on the other hand while it works out at first over time he's like you know what this isn't gonna work out and i've got to let go which is the best part sometimes when you want to force something to work out it really doesn't work out so he's really trying to force this to work between him and his ex-wife just not very compatible you've got to let go and move on but they're still going to be co-parents to their daughter daughter really likes the father City of Angels is a movie that's interesting and then halfway through the movie you're like okay I see where this is going why things happen why people die these angels they're just watchers they like watching over humans that's really it there's like this like cool but also creepy ass scene of them waking up like at dawn and just standing there looking at the sun like just like an army of angels Cage takes a liking into this heart surgeon named Maggie watches over her kind of obsessively and kind of stalking but then she doesn't know that he's there and so he's just kind of in a way creepily watching her being like wow you're amazing 
amazing. And then sometimes he just shows up and be like, hey, what up? I'm uh, not an angel, but what up, you know? And then just disappears. Starts having questions and that's about why people need to die. Why do we need to suffer? And then he meets this one angel who is now a human. He was an angel, but he's like, I want to become a human because it's a lot more fun. You'd experience a lot more joy. Yes, there is suffering, which Cage immediately gets because Maggie dies. But this other angel is like, he's tired of this robotic kind of routine of waking up by dawn, looking. He wants to do something else. And so Cage does that. First thing he experiences is suffering because Maggie dies. Thinks this is all of a larger plot from like the higher ups. Why are they doing this to him? But no, it's just life. People die. You suffer. You know, you grieve over it, but you have to move on because the world isn't going to stop for you. You have to eventually live without them at some point. The Rock is a movie by Michael Bay and it's a lot of fun. The only issue is I'm kind of forgetting about the plot and everything else that's not Nicolas Cage and Sean Connery because they're banter with each other and their scenes are great. And then there's, you know, cool action here and there, maybe a little bit of explosions because Michael Bay, but any other characters and like the actual plots to why they're there, I'm just not remembering right now. I don't write any notes on this movie because I thought like a Michael Bay mindless movie and it kind of isn't because this is one of his earlier works. If there's one selling point on this movie watch out for sean connery and nicholas cage you will not regret that at all is it about alcatraz or an island i think it's about an island and they have to stop this one guy from destroying it because it's bad it's gonna be a big ass explosion yeah you know what this is gonna be a bad entry for me but it is a really fun good movie it's just forgot about it all right Wild That Heart is my first David Lynch movie and I'm gonna be honest, I don't know if I wanna go through his films because I feel like there's a lot of things in his movie that are there for the sake of being there for being weird. A lot of weird shit. This is like a love story between Nicolas Cage and Laura Dern, but then also a road trip later on as well, getting away from their family and then experiencing like sexual assaults, drugs. Willem Dafoe is insane in this movie and then breakups and then getting back together again. Like it should have been a really straightforward love story kind of which would have made this movie go a bit lower on this list but also the weird stuff is i don't mind it why is it there and if this is gonna be a tease for david lynch's filmography then not so sure if i'm gonna be down with going through his filmography if there's gonna be weird zany type stuff or the sake of being weird but then there's this crazy ass like plot to it as well laura dern's mother hired like a fucking hitman to kill nicholas cage essentially so it's like you have that going on weird shit going on a road trip romance stuff this is a lot but it's also really fun it's really engaging so i can't really argue with that i mean i guess that is kind of the whole point a wild crazy love story Sonny is his, I think, only directed film. He's got James Franco playing this prostitute who's coming back from war, but then hates it at home because his mother's forcing something on him, be a prostitute and make money through that. And he clearly, along with this other girl that her mom has with her for some reason, hates that. They don't really want to do that. They want to do something else that's much better and not as demanding. And James Franco wants to really change this life. Something always happens. He's tempted to go back, whether it's money, the feeling, or just like circumstances. There's nothing you can really do about about it so you're just kind of stuck and being like okay i guess i'll do this mindless job pays well gets me by but completely hate it cage does make a cameo in his own movie he's at this bar or place smoking crack i think wearing like this yellow suit he's gonna get tired of doing the same thing over and over again wanting to do something much more than just prostitution him and carol they decide to leave at first it's this dramatic we're being apart it's like okay just get this over with come on you know they're gonna be together and they do they embrace each other and find that they're gonna move on you know i wasn't really expecting to really like the crew the first one but it's like a pretty damn good animated movie about an overprotective father who wants to control everything but you can't control everything because that's a very impossible task and just ask he won't always be there to protect his kid his wife and mother-in-law like even when the daughter gets like this boy or is like interested in this boy he's like who are you i want to check all of you like you know it's like hey man chill out the theme of like overprotection is not always the best it's got great intentions but also the way that you overprotect some things and your kids can come off as a annoying and kind of forcing them to do things that they don't want to and it does change the outlook maybe every little thing about their life not so much and then also embracing this new boy into the family because he lost his family and so he needs a new one national treasure is up this high mainly because of nostalgia back in high school during spanish one sophomore year my spanish teacher loves disney movies he has a poster for most of the movies animated and live action and based on my memory i remember a cinderella story the 2004 version and this one national treasure and it's still a really fun movie first half ish is kind of a heist movie which is shocking because it's disney i don't picture disney producing or just throwing money at one cage but then also having this heist tone 
alone in the first half and then the second half is the treasure hunting and uncharted and tomb raider and indiana jones abigail does feel like a she's there for k just as the love interest she doesn't really do much i feel aside from having that great collection of coins i think i like riley the villain i got about doesn't really matter because it's a very generic finding treasure type adventure hunting villain and then you have uncle ben raimi trilogy spider-man trilogy who's the father just kind of nice seeing him you know i don't even know if he's still alive hopefully he is because he was old even back in 2004 but this movie is up this high because of my spanish teacher snake eyes now i thought this was gonna be a gi joe movie because of snake eyes that recent movie i thought wait a minute is that a remake of this one but no it's not it is a completely different movie it's a mystery film and my favorite part about this movie is different povs and timelines where cage is talking another comic book timeline-esque shot comes in opens door he goes on that escalator like the way that it's towed in the first half is really cool mystery itself is fine just kind of thinking back on it it is fine friend is like the one behind all of this he is doing it for the army or something Something like missiles or something that's not related to this boxing fight because they're at this boxing arena cage is kind of excited because he wants to make money bet on his favorite fighter loses and then that shot goes off and all of it leads to his old buddy his old friend which was the most obvious choice it wasn't gonna be the boxer wasn't gonna be that lady in those sunglasses that other lady the blonde lady i think i think there's a blonde lady I forgot anyways cage is having fun but also still trying to be a good cop lord of war the only thing i knew going in was the opening of that one bullet being in this factory and then going through boxes getting opened up closing and then finally getting to a gun and shooting and killing a person once i got past that i was like okay what is this movie about and it's about nicholas cage selling guns to very dangerous people while lying to his wife and his brother and then getting him killed because his brother's always jittery not able to keep a secret all of the scenes of him selling the guns that's not the most interesting part it's the intent where he kind of enjoys it he's good at it and likes all this money but then also leads him to you know lying to this girl this model and then they have a son which is like not good because he's lying to her right in her face about making all this money eventually it catches up she finds out wants the kid they go away and then the next sequence he loses his brother so all of this was gonna get like caught on and just exposed based off of his very not well thought out long-term plan if the wife found out the people that he's hanging around and just making these deal with not the best people ever kind of shocked he wasn't killed during those deals Deals. Kiss of Death is a really good suspenseful thriller movie. Jimmy, who's like out of prison and has to work with the FBI in order to get inside Nick Cage's club to know about his plans and whatnot, which by the way, he is amazing in this movie. Kind of goofy though, the sunglasses and white tank top and it is a bit much, but it's like, yeah, whatever. This is, this feels right for Cage, all right? But every time he comes up in the bathroom, during the stairs and during the club, you're always thinking, is he going to know and find out that Jimmy's like a mole? Because Jimmy isn't really hiding it that way. Well, but then he's also bargaining for his own family safety as well with the fbi and so he has to do this reluctantly so each time it's like is he really gonna find out every goddamn scene he eventually does but a bit too late because by that point cops are coming in and they've already got him but there were a couple of times where i'm like this is kind of intense and if he finds out right now he is completely dead because cage is willing to kill anyone even in his own club he's that insane kind of unhinged and then jimmy's able to not only get out of cage's area but also get his family back without the issues of the fbi because again they were kind of using him as a way to be like okay if you do this we'll let you go but if you don't and die we don't really care color out of space i really like this movie i like the look of it the colors the whole sci-fi and they don't say aliens but it's probably aliens and et alien related stuff but love the look i love the tone because it starts off as a normal like what's going on mystery over time things are going crazy and insane especially cage where he's like telling his own daughter to fuck off the hell out of my goddamn land is like wait wait a minute hold on you were a nice calm father and now all of a sudden halfway through the movie just aggressively yelling at your daughter what's going on here because of this like landy from space of this big ass like rock i think it's changing everything around them the plants the trees and themselves which is why cage is going crazy the daughter is having these like blood and kind of purple ish white color eyes or whatever but then there's also this old guy in this like shadow or whatever like what the hell is going on and he's just there to explain shit be like there was once this thing or whatever swallowing people changing people it's like okay you know don't really need that but sure this movie might be style over substance it probably is but i don't mind because i really like the look of it and styles and then the only survivor is her friend or boyfriend i think friend or just a guy that has a crush on her he's the only sole survivor because everyone's been swallowed up and just consumed by this quote-unquote alien force and he's the only one that remembers but no one will believe him because it sounds insane and so that whole land and house and whatever it's all pretty much gone 
really like Kill Train. The whole thing about this movie, the way that it's being told is by kills. Each story beat is being moved on by a kill and then another kill and then another kill until it slows down because it needs to explain, you know, why things are happening. But Cage explaining and recapping, going back to two assassins killing each other and no one knows why yet. Assassin kills a person and the other assassin. Next kill, that guy gets killed and then this other guy kills another guy. That guy gets killed. We meet this lady in red, which I think is her actual character name. Just lady in red, I think. Unless I missed it. Probably missed it. But lady in red. Next kill. She meets Cage and they end up doing their thing. And then guess what? Another kill. This guy comes in. Cage poisoned him. He's dead. And then the movie slows down for Cage to talk about why he's here. Owns this bar and he's there because he wants to repay his debt to his friend who died like years ago or something. Who has a daughter. These little girls are being abducted and being used as human trafficking. But then that same daughter is the lady in red. I get why it was there. But it did kill the flow of the kill train of continuous kill. One after another. And then it continues use two more kills cage goes back to the one assassin and he's the one that started all of this to get revenge on the people that killed all those little kids even all those people that were involved with it and didn't have any direct killing to it they were still responsible because they weren't talking about it or didn't do anything about it so it's a really cool movie and concept and it delivers on it mostly the other stuff like the action it's fine you know i just love that concept of kill chain just kill until the movie ends matchstick man this whole movie is just a whole scam because cage was scammed him and god damn it hold on what's his name sam rockwell both are scammers scamming people out of their money with fake lotteries and fake i don't know ads and whatnot there's one issue cage has a germophobic issue where he needs to clean and clean and clean no dust no germs he hates germs but then it gets complicated because his daughter shows up and this was a very believable daughter and scam because turns out she's not really his daughter even though there are moments throughout the whole movie where where they feel like a genuine father and daughter and it sucks that it's not true at all but still felt real to both him and this girl all set up by sam rockwell he's the best of them essentially best parts were both him and his quote-unquote daughter just spending time having some fun yes it's fake but it felt genuine it didn't feel like it was fabricated in terms of just having fun and then it's also cage's you know second chance to be like a good father and not be involved with scams and that's why he got a divorce from his wife and everything like he's always doing this stuff Kind of like a knife getting like poked into your goddamn thigh and then you're just twisting that shit. Not his real daughter. It's a lie. It's been set up. But then he was really happy. But in the future, he's working like a normal job. He meets her again. Both go their separate ways. Getting peace because Sam is nowhere to be found. While Cage is pretty much happy. Just living a normal life. Bringing Out the Dead, directed by Martin Scorsese. This has the typical Cage craziness, but it's not portrayed as like a meme. Cage is a paramedic and over time, he just slowly loses his sanity because he's tired of working at night, seeing all these dead bodies, probably becoming desensitized. And over time, you're just like, you know what? I don't really care about these patients. Maybe seeing them die might not be an issue. And so there's just one like character that's like, hey, my father's gonna die. He's in a hospital bed, take care of him. And there are these scenes and dreams where he's like, should I? And he's going insane. He's got these dark baggy like under his eyes and he's losing it. He's not doing so well. It just gets pretty damn dark because you think he's a paramedic. He should be nice. Keep calm, right? Not have thoughts about killing patients or going around at night listening to crazy ass people on the streets and whatnot. Or just like getting out of a car crash and saying like, ah, shut up to his partner and just walking it off. And yet he's the one that's suffering kind of way more. Well, maybe not like physically, but you know what? Maybe not. Maybe I'm just talking out of my ass right there. But either way, he is still somewhat suffering Amos and Andrew. If you have Nicolas Cage and Samuel L. Jackson in the same movie, it's bound to be really good. And this movie is really good. Love that this whole movie is just a whole misunderstanding between these neighbors who are very much nosy. They see Samuel L. Jackson at a window in a house and they think that he's like robbing the place. Samuel L. Jackson bought this place. Cops calling the news be like, hey, someone broke in. There's a hostage. Misunderstanding, missed time, misplaced, you know. And then this eventually gets cops, news outlets, multiple news outlets. Samuel L. Jackson's friends from like another town or Hey, Brad Dorf, who's a cop? All the cops in the movies are just bumbling idiots. Brad Dorf is the most idiotic one where he's just impulsiveness, doesn't think what he's doing. Got like a mustache, a ridiculous mustache. And so because they're all so bad, they need to get Nicolas Cage, who's in jail, is a criminal. And they're like, hey man, go kill this guy. He's robbing a place. We will let you go. He goes in, ties up Samuel Jackson. They have a nice chat. It's all play for laughs, which is great. Nosy ass neighbors leading to this whole damn issue of all of these people just surrounding this whole house. Both eventually get out. Cage is let go, being free, and then Samuel Jackson's with his wife, I think, moving to another area because doesn't want nosy ass neighbors wrongfully calling the cops on them. 
Birdie is a really heartwarming, really good early Cage movie. A coming of age for Cage, but also his post-war trauma. The story's being told by present and past. Cage befriends this kid who is not mentally the best. This kid is not mentally with Cage, but Cage befriends him and sees you're collecting birds and you seem nice and you know what, I will befriend you. This friendship goes into the present where Cage is back from the war, he's all patched up and whatnot, sees that his friend is in this mental asylum is like, come on man, get up, please stop, stop acting like this. And so you have Cage doing with war stuff, his friend who he wants to get out and a general, or not general, but the leader or whatever of this asylum, kind of being a hard ass, just not really believing anything. Cage thanks him for stepping up to his own father. Birdie is the only person that he knows stepped up to his father and got away with it without getting hit. And then there's even one point where this guy's like, hey, you know, maybe you should be in this asylum. Like, nah, shut up. Needs to talk to someone, probably, you know, maybe a therapist, but maybe not an asylum. Birdie, throughout this whole time, just not responding. It is really about Cage and Birdie being very much close friends in the past and now in the present, wanting that friendship back, but also trying to help each other because they need to get out. They need to fly again. And they do. Birdie, like, jumps off. I was like, wait a minute, he killed himself? Luckily, it was like, okay, movie did it end off on a dark, dark way because Cage is being beaten, post trauma stuff, war stuff. Don't let it end on a dire note, please. He just jumps off on a very short ledge, just flying. I never would have watched this movie if I didn't force myself to go through Cage's filmography. I would have been like, what is this movie about birds and birdies? Like, I don't care about it, but I'm glad I did. I've never seen Grindhouse. I've only seen Death Proof. Never actually seen both Planet Terror and Death Proof together as one. Which, you know what? I can just split these two movies just to make it 100 movies. But whatever. I've already counted this as one. But Cage is only in one trailer directed by Rob Zombie. It's about ladies and Nazis or wolves or something. But then Cage is playing Fu Manchu, which is a movie I would have pretty much loved to watch. I don't think that's actually an actual movie, but it's a fake trailer. And we just see him with this ridiculous costume. Never seen Planet Terror. Never really had the need or itch to watch it but you know what it's a lot of fun it's about this girl named cherry and how she loses her leg and her leg is essentially ar just an assault rifle killing people with their goddamn legs this is a zombie apocalypse movie josh brolin kill his wife for some reason uh, why don't you get a divorce or affair but whatever you know i feel like with any zombie stuff there has to be like a helicopter sequence near the end the kills and the zombies themselves were actually really cool and fun also bruce willis is in his movie kind of randomly as one of the soldiers as well and then death proof I wouldn't say it's like my favorite Tarantino movie, but it's still a fun movie. There's a lot of feet in it. We all know why, because Tarantino loves his feet. The man know what he loves. Kurt Russell is this badass person who likes killing in this cool ass car. Seen in a club, that's, you know, good. Just visually to look at. And then eventually catches up to him because the other ladies come in and drive him off a goddamn cliff. Both of these movies, Planet Terror and Death Proof are like really good, well made, really fun movies. The Unbearable Weight of Massive Talent. This is the last movie that I watched, his most recent movie. Everyone was raving about it, being like, this is the best Cage movie in like 10 years or whatever. And I will agree that it is one of his better movies as of like the past five years, alongside with like Pig and Kill Chain. At first, I thought this movie was gonna be kind of elf like indulgent type of movie. And luckily, it wasn't because Pedro Pascal comes in being like, hey, what up? I'm a huge fan. Face Off. They love Face Off. Movie starts off with Con Air. Movie plays on the fact that Cage is, you know, not doing so well and acting roles are getting dry he's not an a-star actor no more people don't like him he's like you know what whatever i'm gonna quit acting i'm gonna go on the trip to mexico tiffany haddish who is kind of hit or miss for me she's good in this movie because she's not you know doing comedy fbi cop wanting Keisha to get on the inside because apparently pedro pascal is like this evil person so now that he has to do this being all stressed out getting the family involved their friendship between pedro and cage it's a lot of fun it feels genuine it feels like cage finally found someone who can understand Understand him and just be really good friends and he's not really the boss of this he has his own boss who's like the one that's behind everything and so now both of them know that they're kind of not who they are both are at this like place putting guns at each other being like really don't want to but i might have to and then both of them like but i don't want to kill you but you're my friend it's like oh, this is nice this is a very fun surprisingly heartwarming friendship movie bromance movie while also kind of being about cage's filmography but then also turned into something more than just a cage movie for me it was a perfect movie to watch last I was with everyone when I heard of Pig, movie about Nicolas Cage losing his pig and everyone thought he was going to be John Wick and kill all these people because he wants his goddamn pig back. But the movie's not that at all. It's not an action movie. It's more of a drama about loss. He has now lost his only friend, this pig. And so now he's going through kind of the stages of grief. Okay, I'll go find him. But going back in the city, Cage used to be this well-known person, wealthy person. But now he's out in the woods getting truffles for money, living outside of the city, off the grid. And at no point where you're like, is he really going to? 
not you know start fighting the only point where he's fighting is this underground area of fight club but every time like the dinner scenes at the restaurant dinner scene at his father's place you're like is he gonna throw hands or do something but no he's just there being like i want my pig back you can't he's dead now he's gone okay i guess i'll just move on with his loss or kill myself the ending is very left up to the audience of like did he kill himself or did he just learn to move on and i think he based off of his nature and this movie and his like personality he probably killed himself because he's a very calm person but maybe he didn't he's very calm but maybe very like you know what life ain't worth living if i can't find another pig but then also he's very much lonely now so yeah i don't know he might have killed himself but i hope he didn't but it's also because the movie's so kind of depressing in a way Fast times are Richmond High. I think everyone knows that one amazing scene that still holds up of a pool scene, peeking out a window. Everyone knows that scene. But it's about high school, coming of age, what you go through high school. And you know, movies do exaggerate it a bit, but you know, this is kind of like similar where you have the one guy that cares about himself and about sex, gets that one girl pregnant. And then there's those girls that get pregnant in high school, which I didn't know any girls at all. Wait, hold on. Take that back. There's the one girl in high school I had geometry with. She was sitting in front of me and then she was gone for like two or three months. Later on, I see her coming out of the counselor's office probably to tell them hey i'm pregnant and she had a big ass belly and that was the last time i saw her clearly the girl in this movie kind of wanted it but now it's kind of a mistake because she doesn't know what to do you have the one bro surfer dude cool i'm gonna go surfing smoke some weed and i love that starling with him and his teacher being like just like study or just trying to encourage him hey stop being like this go and study and then you have the older brother who's like i have no idea what to do in my life i have a girlfriend broke up with me okay still working at this restaurant or whatever kind of don't like it life sucks what i do with it so i would imagine if you you're a teenager around this time you're like, you know what this is very somewhat similar to my high school maybe not anymore jocks my high school did not have any jocks or bullies because there's this bullying club at school so if you were a bully they would get your ass essentially and it's got a really good song from jackson brown somebody's baby con air is a lot of fun you have the villain whose name is cyrus the virus which is a really ridiculous funny name and he is a villainous threat but then also at the same time i can't take him seriously because his name is cyrus the virus it's such a stupid name didn't expect dave Chappelle. he's got something in his mouth first one to let go of all those prisoners and let loose on his plane this is like snakes on a plane but for prisoners prisoners on a plane going crazy wanting money wanting whatever nicholas cage is just a man who is in here because he has to be he like killed the man accidentally so he went prison he served his time getting letters from his wife and daughter very you know sweet wholesome stuck in a room full of actual criminals and now he has to play along and play on the dirty side meanwhile you have john kosak on the ground trying to tell everyone hey this plane got hijacked we need to not kill nicholas cage and not you know just ignore this and then go back up cage once again trying to protect his prison buddy who gets killed and then that's a breaking point of like okay i gotta bring this plane down it lands in las vegas which i think is a practical effect someone built an actual set of vegas Vegas, which was really cool and whoever did that it must have been real expensive explosions and large ass things is getting fucking thrown and crashed and then after all of this hellish experience he's able to meet his daughter and wife for the very first time in years you know hugging it out going away to end off the movie so while it's a very fun chaotic movie with the very ridiculous villain name it's also a very heartwarming and sweet movie at the end as well of a father trying to get back to his family Raising Arizona is another really fun movie where two really bad people, a couple, really want to start a family. And so what do they do? They decide to kidnap that first scene of Nicolas Cage in that room full of triplets. I thought that was his and her kid, but no, it's not. He's like in his house, breaking in and stealing his goddamn baby, which leads to more lying, more further like complicated things where they have to lie to their like in-laws and family members and steal baby diapers and go back to their old habits. Like Nicolas Cage is like, okay, you know what? I will not be a criminal no more. He goes into this like store puts on a mask like hey give me all the money give me all the adapters like god damn it you said you weren't gonna do this eddie gets pissed off she drives off and then that whole sequence that whole chase sequence of like cage running away from the cops getting chased by all those damn dogs going to the goddamn grocery store dropping the diaper coming back later on to get it again that was all amazing and the dreams about like this guy got the name but this guy on his motorcycle killing every living thing that he sees even goddamn geckos on the rock kind of ridiculous but also a badass so he eventually gets the cage and cage is able to outspart him by pulling off a grenade pin exploding him which was awesome and then these two other prisoners which are friends of cage they get out of prison in a really cool way of digging out of the ground and they want the baby for their own gain of money but also one of them wants a family with this baby as well and so you have all these things going on eventually ed and cage are like okay we have to get this baby back to its rightful owners they do they get caught and then the owner's like you know what you guys are good people right this baby back it's like nah man you guys still kidnap a kid and you're just being let go of kind of easy but then guess what there's hope at the end because cage is dreaming about this family 
of him and Ed having kids and then having grandkids and so probably gonna become true. Vampire's Kiss. Once again, I think everyone knows this movie based off of the alphabet scene, the memes, the A, B, C, D, E, F, G. An amazing scene. And so I thought that, you know, Cage going full on crazy. I thought that was a late 90s, early 2000s thing where people only noticed it or he only did it during that time. Wasn't expecting it in this movie during 1988. He just goes full on crazy. So assaulting people, talking to himself, yelling, saying all the alphabet letters. Which you know what? I still don't know if that vampire is real or not. I don't know if he's just using this vampire bite as an excuse to be like, I'm crazy now. Or he was actually bit by a vampire. His assault with his lady would backfire because the brother comes in with a goddamn like stake essentially and stakes him in his own like apartment while lights shining, implying like a vampire kill. Even the therapist scenes, those are not real. Whole like first entire therapist scene, just all fake in his head. I thought those were like real, genuine like therapist stuff. But nope, all of that was just in his head because of a goddamn vampire or maybe a vampire. I might need to rewatch this movie. One, just for entertainment value because of Nicolas Cage, but also maybe to reconfirm if I missed some things because I probably did. I've only seen this movie once. Maybe a rewatch would be like, okay, this makes a lot more sense. Or maybe this is actually like a real vampire. It's a fun ass movie. It's a, almost a great movie. 8mm might be the most scariest Cage movie yet. Cage is obsessed with this like 8mm tape of a girl getting tortured and assaulted. And so it is his goal and journey to find out what's going on behind this like tape. And he soon realizes that it is much more messed up. He meets Joaquin Phoenix who's there to help him out. He tells all his FBI officers like, hey, we should probably check this out. But he's like, nah, man, this is a cold case. You know, no one cares about it, but he cares. Maybe this guy did it because he has free time. Maybe he did it because he knew that he wasn't gonna get caught or maybe he just likes it. Maybe Maybe this person was born in a messed up way, abusive parents, alcoholic dad, you know, like he's just trying to find any little thing to link why a person would do this to this girl. He even goes to the girl's mother's house to be like, hey, this cold case isn't cold no more. I want to find out who did this. Sue learns the person who did this, he did it because he enjoyed it. He liked it. He wasn't born messed up. They didn't have abusive parents. Wasn't weird in any way. He was just like, you know what? I like doing this because I can and I want to. And that is terrifying because there's no like 100% proof or scientific proof of a person being a murderer or anything and that scares him he has a family he goes home to cry to them because it's scary it's a very scary thought to know that any person could do this even someone as normal as not with abusive parents or anything they have the ability to do such a thing like this and so despite being a thriller i think this is more of a horror movie because of all those images and all the torture scenes and the thought of like a normal person who's just normal can do a very heinous act Kick-Ass is a kick-ass movie. Nick Cage has a daughter being played by Chloe Grace Moretz. They're just really good together, believable as a father and daughter, trains her to become a complete badass. And then also he's just Batman, like straight up. Nicolas Cage is Batman. He's just playing Batman. Cannot convince me otherwise, he's just Batman. So he's been Superman, voice role, kind of. Nick Cage has done everything, you know, just Batman and Superman now. Kick-Ass is just a normal everyday average high school student who wants to do more than just what because, let's be honest, high school is boring as hell. He wants to become a hero. I love that first scene of him being a hero. He gets almost killed. He gets like stabbed. It's like, okay, yeah, this is not looking so good. Cage and Chloe Grace is like, okay, you know what? We want you. You're not trained, but you guys, you know, kind of the intel guy. And then his like high school nemesis, Red Mist. He also wants to become a hero, but doesn't know how to be one because he's not well trained. His father is, but he's kind of lesser than his father. Their action sequences are not done well because they both suck at being a hero. Cage does die though because he has to. He looks way too cool in that Batman costume, you know? The belt, the mask and everything and the villain dies in a big ass rocket explosion which is always the best way to kill off a villain leaving las vegas is cage's best like serious role i think it's a very serious movie with you know downtime of like normal dinner or just fun things but most of the movie is cage who is divorced lost his job is going to vegas with all the money that he has left just to drink himself to death early on i thought okay he's gonna find someone right and not die but even elizabeth Shu actually really likes cage can't even help him felt certain way about him and it's like okay this is a actually good relationship right nope so halfway i was like okay once he cheated on her i was like no going back he's actually gonna kill himself and he does and she decides to write him one more time before he actually passes away and it's a very depressing movie i would not recommend people watch this movie if you're either depressed or have a drinking problem because it's very tragic very depressing very down and then a very down note you want cage to win and not kill himself right he's just long gone this is all saving this guy he's made his decision just like in his eyes you can see that he's done with life so what's the one thing he do drink and drink and drink which sucks because elizabeth she was there for him like she actually felt for him and she was gonna be with him and you know they were going to his pool or whatever but in the end he was like no it is cage's best performance in terms of drama
I'm so glad Cage voiced Spider-Man Noir in Spider-Verse because it gives me another reason and excuse to watch Spider-Verse. And it's still one of the best Spider-Man movies. Probably is the best Spider-Man movie ever. It's got a really cool animation, cool way to introduce characters through comic books. Miles Morales is a good, relatable character. The spider Porky or Pig was funny. Robot Spider-Man was cool. Spider-Man Noir was pretty damn funny of being black and white and just matches and wind. Why is there random wind? Spider-Gwen's really cool. All of them have lost Uncle Ben or someone close to them which is a very vital point in all the Spider-Mans just suffer essentially. Love that Kingpin's the villain who's drawn very like over kind of the top, very big and bulky, but that's kind of the point of him. And his motive is just to get his wife back, you know? He lost his wife, he's like, you know what? Multiverse. That's just lady from this other universe. Works out, you know? And it's got an amazing theme by Post Malone, Sunflower. This is a just a perfect Spider-Man movie for a Spider-Verse movie. You have multiple Spider-Man, Miles Morales is good, all the Uncle Ben's and Uncle whatever, the suffering that they have to go through because people love it when Spider-Man suffers apparently. And number one, what I think is the best movie from Nicolas Cage is Face Off. This movie's great. It is perfect, okay? Even the whole, like, last sequence of fighting on that boat, where there is clearly two stunt people on a fucking boat. Even that's like, you know what? Funny enough, it, it is an issue, whatever. You have such a ridiculous concept of 3D printing a human face onto John Travolta as Cage and vice versa. Both of them having to act like one another was fantastic. The singing, the fuck you, the beginning dance. Then he keeps making those ugly, amazing faces every time he touches someone both now have to fight each other because they're making it super personal cage's brother dies john travolta wants his revenge because his son died much more than just getting you in jail or prison i have to kill you now and he does but they wearing his face while also looking back at his own face and then that nicholas cage face that was creepy as hell it was funny but i was like um oh, that's kind of creepy and then those scenes of them like mirroring each other wall to wall like gun scene that was really cool and then the whole daughter thing which i know it isn't like john travolta but we're in the face of like her father so it makes makes it kind of weird but then all that comes back because he taught her how to use like a knife used it on him and it's got amazing action like that plane sequence going through that like carrier thing kids jumping out with dual weapons and then even the boat sequence that was done really well john woo did a really good job and so i'm pretty sure everyone's seen face off if you haven't go watch it you can't convince me that this is not the best movie from both cage and travolta's filmographies because both were at their best at this point and that was it for watching and ranking it every goddamn Nicolas Cage movie. Talked about them one last time. It was fun. Most of it, at least. Those, like, action movies, some of them were like, I don't care about these. So overall, though, his film is, like, kind of even. I think there's more good than bad movies, probably. So yeah, that is it for me. This has been The Road So Far, and thank you for watching.